Uh, hey, everybody. Um, thanks for having me. Thank you, Jonas, for organizing. Uh, so, yeah, so I, um, my name is Yotam, and I have been making music my whole life. Uh, uh, my instrument is piano. Um, and I went to uh, UC Berkeley to study uh, jazz piano and kind of uh, a couple years into my program, I took a Max MSP class and that was my first introduction into uh, combining programming and music. Um, and I ended up working at uh, this place called the Center for New Music and Audio Technology, which is um, a little computer music research center at UC Berkeley. Uh, and it kind of showed me a different world of how to make music um, with code, uh, building, you know, instruments, building specific uh, tech setups for a single piece, uh, having a computer on stage um, that's not doing playback, but is highly interactive, um, algorithmic composition systems, kind of, me, kind of led me down uh, a path um, to uh, transitioning mostly to writing code for music making. Uh, and so now that for me, that broadly fits in a few areas. So I, um, build instruments. Um, and by that, I mean, I make synthesizers and audio processors and effects, uh, for musicians to, uh, make music with. Um, I build some pieces, uh, that, I'll show you a couple, but they broadly fit in a, in a lot of different categories uh, with those instruments. Um, and uh, I teach uh, and I maintain a, a free and open source software library for uh, writing code and music. Um, I wanted to actually talk mostly, I think today, I'll show you some of the, the um, projects that I've worked on that are all browser-based music projects. And then uh, I was gonna talk a lot about sort of machine learning and music. Uh, that's what I've been working on mostly in the past uh, three or four years. Okay, so um, uh, I'll start with the software library that I was telling you a little about. So um, this is a uh, software library, so it's all code. Um, for generating sound. Uh, so it's basically Ableton Live code runs entirely in the browser. Um, you know, it's not as good as Ableton Live. I'm one person and they are hundreds of people. Um, but it, it kind of falls into a lot of the same things, which is synthesis, audio effects processing, uh, like timeline um, looping. This is the code that generates that beep. So I created a synthesizer, uh, and then I have that synth play an attack and release on C4 for the duration of an eighth note. Um, and, uh, you know, you can string together multiple notes and with different timing, uh, and then eventually you can build up some uh, more complex examples with effects um, and different processing. So this is kind of the basis of some of these projects that I'll show you. So, okay, so all of this is composed entirely with code. And this is sort of an experiment, uh, experimental song, they'll call it, um, where you interact with the song playing live in the browser through scrolling. So I'm just scrolling up right now. And as I scroll up, the tempo gets faster. The lyrics change actually when you scroll down. So now I'm scrolling way down. It's slow down. As you, you just 
just kind of scroll to progress through the song. Sort of the B section. Anyway, that's a jazz dot computer. You can all play it if you want. Um, so I worked on that with Sarah Rothberg, and I've been building a lot of browser-based music uh, experiments since then. So um, another one that I did with Google is called Chrome Music Lab. These are, again, like a bunch of little code and music experiments. Uh, this is sort of like in a tutorial kind of thing, roughly for uh, kids, I guess, originally. It was sort of geared as a music education thing. Um, it's taken on a bit of a life of its own. So this is a actually like a, a shared piano. So I don't know how many people this supports, but... If someone else wants to jump in, then we'll all be able to play this you know, at the same time. Uh, and you use like uh, uh, ASDF, like, like Ableton Live across the center. You know, this is again, just using all of that same, that same backend, that same. Um, code base. And the idea is that also you can now scroll through our entire collective composition that we've made or jump back to the current time. This is another kind of one that uh, y'all might find interesting, which is another sort of shared piano experience. You can see the piano stuff really comes out. Uh, I ended up just making a lot of iterations of pianos. Um, so this is a... Uh, um, just a really nice piano browser-based sampler, like multi-velocity, you know, sort of like contact instrument as best as I could make it uh, that runs entirely in the browser for free. Um, uh, it runs off of a MIDI keyboard. You have these like nice uh, visuals. I worked with a um, uh, friend and collaborator, Alex Chen. Um, each of these has like a slightly different uh, effect applied to it. We actually showed this at the uh, Cooper Hewitt Museum here in New York, which is a Smithsonian design museum. We had it set up sort of as an installation. Um, and the kind of interesting thing about this is that you can also record and that gets uploaded and then everyone's compositions get uploaded for the past two or three years since we've had this. Um, and you can just listen to this radio of anything that everyone, anyone's recorded on this website. generates also a unique link for you so if you wanted to like share this you know record a song and then send it to someone really quickly uh, this kind of makes that possible some of the browser based stuff that I've made um, there have been other people who have made uh, some pretty cool like browser based albums uh, with this stuff so one of them uh, is called Helios Yume um, and this is an entire album that uh, this group made of um, browser-based songs. Each with just really elegant, very simple interactions where you can modify different aspects. Essentially, like, just playing with stems and a really elegant way. So this is like, you know, fairly simple to achieve. Um, you know, there's some filtering that's going on here with different parts of the composition. This is one of my favorites came out um, 
uh, maybe three years ago or so. So there's this live coding environment called Orca by uh, this duo called 100 Rabbits. Tone.js is actually the audio backend. So people do live coded performance with this framework called Orca, and it's got this super interesting sort of tracker style layout where you are pushing different keys on your keyboard. And uh, if you're familiar with the Tenorion, like things sort of ripple out from different key presses and like it initiates different behaviors. Uh, it's a really beautifully designed um, live coding environment, uh, has MIDI support, and so Tone.js also is one of the supported uh, synthesizer backends. Um, so you can, people do live coding with, uh, with this framework and with Tone.js. I think those are, the, those are the examples that jump to mind in terms of people using it in a live or other composition environment. Yeah. All right. So just to give a little background in terms of machine learning music, uh, I think that these sort of automated music generating systems or algorithmic music generating systems are not um, very new. Uh, I mean, you can even think of uh, like the game pieces that uh, Cage did as sort of algorithmic compositions without any computers. Uh, you know, Zanakis did a lot of algorithmic composition using Markov chains with computers, but very, very early computers. Uh, and then David Cope was one of the first people to do uh, really accurate, I would say, statistical compositions, um, where he's just creating a series of Markov chains. And a Markov chain is basically like, uh, okay, you're at C, you have a 50% chance of moving to D, and you have a 50% chance of moving to E. And then now you move to E. Now you're at E. You have a 40% chance of moving back to C, or a 60% chance of moving up to G. So you kind of create these sort of just networks and you roll a dice at every single transition that you get. Uh, and eventually you have an entire song. So David Cope did this with a bunch of different sort of romantic era, mostly piano, but I think there's also symphonic work. Um, so this, I'll, I'll just play you a couple of seconds of it. Sounds like Chopin, right? It's very convincingly Chopin, um, but this is not a piece that Chopin wrote. It's literally just generated through that technique that I just described. Um, and he generated many, many uh, different composers and different compositions. So this is sort of like a, 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 a statistical approach. So the more popular, and as you'll hear, sort of like doesn't work as well, uh, yet version of this. Now everyone is using neural nets to do this same kind of thing. But neural nets are again, a sort of statistically based, though function in an entirely uh, different way. Um, you can think of uh, machine learning maybe just basically as, uh, you know, you can write a function to do something, say like add two numbers. So uh, you have a function which takes a number X and adds two to it. And so if you give it four, it'll return six. And if you give it six, it'll return eight. Um, and you wrote a function and you know exactly what it does. Machine learning kind of works from the opposite. You say, given four, I want to get six. What is this function? Given six, I want to get eight. What is this function? Given eight, I want to get 10. What is this function? So it'll test out a bunch of different ways of arriving at that answer uh, and sort of figure out that function for you. And the interesting part is that it will kind of figure out a lot of methods that maybe you didn't think of. Like you're going to write your function in that specific way that you know how to write the function. The neural net is going to write your function in a way that you would have not really imagined. And also is when you look at how it works kind of indecipherable. 
Uh, it's they're they're often called like black boxes because you don't really know what's happening inside of it. You know that you're getting the answer on that you asked for, sort of, or a version of that or something close to it, uh, but you have no idea how it works. Um, so this is from 2002. This is now uh, using a, a neural network called an LSTM, uh, which there will be a couple of examples uh, that use the same network that I'll show you. So there's a lot of things that make this much worse. Uh, I think um, the piano sound is horrible. Uh, there's no velocity, as you can hear. Like, there's a lot of just like didn't consider <laughs> these very musical fundamental things because he was trying to show this technological demo, uh, which in 2002 was like a very big breakthrough. And he wrote this really interesting thing, which was something like, um, uh, turns out the LSTM is a good method for generating music and it will generate music for as long as you're willing to listen to it. Um, which I thought just was an interesting thing because all of these, a lot of these technologies kind of lead towards this world where it's like, yeah, you could hit enter on your keyboard and generate 10 billion hours of music that no one will ever listen to. Um, so kind of what is that, what does that mean? For me, I'm much more interested in applying these same techniques, but in a way that sort of you have to listen to in a way that's interactive in a way that is, you know, given to a musician, um, or, uh, given to, you know, a listener, uh, so that they are sort of the listening is the important part of the music generating, you know, a billion hours of MIDI is not music to me. Fast forward now to 2018, Doug Eck, the same person actually, uh, formed this team at Google, um, called Magenta, and they do a lot of music generation. So this is currently kind of the uh, state-of-the-art music generation. This is an unconditioned sample, meaning that there was no input. It was basically just like, you know, hey, neural net, just start generating some stuff. We'll end it when we choose to end it. Um, and so this is an unconditioned sample, just something that it generated. represent are, uh, they call them attention. So it is when w it was generating these notes, it was paying attention to these previous notes. And as you remember, when I was describing the Markov chain, that's not how it works. It only cares really about the previous one note. Sometimes it cares about the previous two or three notes, but kind of never beyond that. So this is a technique which is able to really consider previous parts of the composition. And unlike the Markov chain, again, like you're never going to get these like motifs in the markup chain. I mean, you're very unlikely to get these sort of motifs in the markup chain. Whereas this thing, you can see it, it is riffing on a sort of this like, uh, you know, back and forth little block chord section um, in a number of different ways. And that kind of actually evolves over time. Um, so what it's doing is like pretty interesting and new. Again, for me, it's like, and so what, you know, like, okay, you generated some piano music of some dead composers. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not new and it's not very musical. I mean, it is like actually really intriguing, I think, technologically and really interesting to listen to sometimes. I think that the thing that makes it interesting is when you have people in the loop, when you have musicians making decisions and uh, you focus on those people. So um 
these are some of the things that I've made kind of with this, you know, viewpoint that I'm telling you about. This is using some of the same techniques. Uh, so this is a LSTM neural network. Uh, and here it is set up as a duet. So it's never, the machine is never just going to play forever. Um, it's always going to be sort of a back and forth between the, the listener and the, the neural network. So it starts with a little tutorial. <laughs> Okay, so the way that this works, I'm going to, again, use the same, this is another piano that I've built, uh, uh, same uh, QWERTY, or ASDF, play a couple things. Um, and it will kind of riff off of what I give it. So you can see it, it played in the same kind of key it's kind of hard to play sharps and flats on this, but I'll just start at a different position. So it kind of gets towards some of the tonality, repeats some of the rhythmic phrases that I'm playing. Um, if I just give it, let's see, a, like a bunch of... This one is uh, just monophonic, so it's only going to deal with melodies, this one specifically. Uh, and that was just a limitation of the neural net uh, that I was using and how it was trained. There are ones now that are more polyphonic. They have different kind of trade-offs. Polyphony is just so, so much more complicated than monophonic. So this is sort of, uh, again, kind of a back and forth. Uh, and the interesting thing, I think, um, for me is that it, you know, you can kind of learn about how a neural net works. Um, I, I don't like the narrative that machine learning is magic and AI is a person that does something magical for you. Uh, I think that the, the way that neural nets work is actually, um, super interesting. And I would like to highlight that and, and kind of make it as transparent as possible. To, for people using it. So this is another kind of application of machine learning. And the idea here is that, um, you know, machine learning is also really good at kind of organizing uh, things. So can it organize um, 15,000 short four second audio samples? The idea here is that um, all samples within a given area will sort of sound similar to each other. So you have sort of like noisy burst, let's call it, sounds over here. A lot of short, clippy sounds over here. Yeah, low thuds. You know, to make it interactive, uh, you can arrange those in a little drum sample. So this was a, a fun experiment in collaboration with Cal McDonald. Um, with a, a previous project that he had done arranging. This is called the T-SNE, T-S-N-E. It's a way of, of taking really complex things and making it into a 2D or a 3D uh, map. Uh, and you'll see this kind of technique is, is often used in machine learning to visualize really complex data. So this is a suite of Ableton Live plugins that run within Max for Live. So I think you do need the Ableton Live Studio or the suite to run this. Are there any questions that anyone has while this is uh, loading up? How would you like rate the creative process working with uh, machine learning and creating music instead of you just walking over to a piano trying to write something, compose anything? 
Like what's, yeah. what's, your, what's the I difference mean, between those two for you? For me, it's quite different because I'm also building the tools. So I don't have any objective distance from the tools. So when I use the tools, for example, all I can think of is like, oh, what would make it better? How can I do this? Oh, this was bad output. Like what if I modified something? So, uh, but I think more generally kind of the question is, or like the, the, for me, it's really, really interested in kind of newness. Uh, and this is, um, you know, something that's exciting to me because it is so brand new and the, you know, the piano has been that way for at least 150 years. Um, and there's still so many new things to do with it. Uh, and then this is kind of a way to, to jumpstart that, to kind of get there faster. Uh, and then eventually gets us beyond the piano and, uh, into just more, um, you know, more people's musical concepts. Uh, okay. So this is finally loaded. So, uh, when you download it, it will just show up as, uh, this little, uh, AMXD is the file type, um, Gento Studio AMXD. And the first time you drop it in, it will take quite a long time to load. All right. So this is the plugin version of that website that I showed you. Uh, it uh, gives you a few other capabilities. It'll do drums or melody. Um, the drums one in general work uh, pretty well. The melody one, you kind of heard how it works. So this is basically like roll a dice and get some new machine learned samples. So I'm just going to hit generate and it's going to generate four uh, new drum tracks. And I'm just going to choose where I want to drop it in my session. Temperature is basically like the amount of randomness that's applied to the sample. So let's make it like kind of random. Generate, it's processing. Uh, and then here it spit out four samples. Let's put on uh, the drum machine so that we can hear it. shuffle but you know you get the idea that this is this could be an interesting starting point for a song or just looking for some random samples it'll do the same thing with melody so you can generate a bunch of melodic phrases so i'm gonna now take these samples and apply a different plugin um so this plugin is a humanize function if you all know what humanize is it's basically like you sort of like shift some things around and you know, add some randomness to the, the velocity is usually how it works and it sounds more human because humans are imprecise and have random velocity. So this is the machine learning version of that. And the way that it was done is basically um, real drummers recorded about 10 hours on a MIDI drum set and then like heavily quantized, take out all of the velocity and all of the, and align it to, snap it to a grid and then train a neural net to do the opposite, to take the aligned ones and go back to the original one. Um, so it's the machine learning uh, humanized. So we'll take one of these samples, we'll take this weird shuffle one. Uh, again, there's sort of a temperature that you can apply to it and it's gonna output the humanized version. Uh, all right, so you can see that it added a lot of variation in the velocity and also scooted some things around so they're not all aligned right on the downbeat. This is the original one. And 
then this is the humanized one. Took a lot of liberties with it, but um, you know, one kind of interesting thing about this plugin is it is it's much more of a humanized function. So for example, if you play, if you give it MIDI, which is actually impossible to play on a drum kit, like let's say you give it all of the toms at once, right? No one can like hit their stick so that they hit or not easily. I'm sure that many people can, but you can't easily hit all of the toms at once. And it's probably not in its data set. So it will actually choose one of those or two of those maybe at most based on the context that it exists in. And so it, it will kind of apply a lot more transformation to uh, your output than a normal human eyes would. Let's just try one more. Just like a rock drums. And then this is the human eyes version. This one's not being played because it's right before the beat. But you can kind of hear, you know, it took some liberties with the kick drum um, between the two. It added an extra little in here, which is kind of cool. Uh, this is my kind of favorite plugin, actually, of all of these. Um, and then the other ones, you know, if you're curious and interested, you can play around with it. Um, so that's the Magento Studio. Uh, okay, so the thing that I've been working on for the past year uh, is um, a neural net technique to do timbre transfer. So take one instrument and turn it into another. So, you know, one kind of metaphor that you could think of is sort of like, if an instrument is a language, uh, this is like Google Translate. Uh, so you play saxophone and out comes guitar, or you play guitar and out comes piano, or you play piano and out comes violin, or, you know, you're not limited to solo instruments. So you can play, you can whistle and have it come out a string quartet, or you can play string quartet and have it come out as eight bit chiptune music, kind of whatever data set you can train a model on, it can then do this, uh, transformation and, uh, the thing that has been really challenging is getting it to work uh, in real time. So I think really the, the most interesting, most musical aspect of this stuff is to get it to work in real time. I think that musicians rely on real time feedback and instantaneous to be able to, to make their next decision. So it's like, it's not, you know, kind of like I was saying, like, it's not very musical to generate a million hours of MIDI. Uh, to me, it's, it's much less musical to play a sample, hit transform, hear what that sample sounds like transformed. It's much more like you need to kind of understand it like an, an instrument and then be able to play it as an instrument. Um, so this is kind of where it started. Um, this is me a year ago whistling to symphony. And, you know, you can hear a lot of harmonies that come out that aren't in the whistling, but because symphonies play in harmony, you know, they don't just play one really high like the literal translation of this would just be probably a flute approximating this as closely as possible. And it would sound a lot like a whistle, but the, the real translation with this metaphor is that it would be played as if it were being played on this with the symphony. Um, I'll show you a few more examples of um, working with my partner. I think it does.
uh, it's not like we're trying to, you know, cover up what the input source is or like totally remove it. So you can still hear the voice in the output. And it's not like the piano one sounds like a symphony. Uh, it ends up being sort of its own thing altogether uh, that I think is the really interesting thing. Um, that it kind of can open up new new musical potential or new musical possibility for people. Uh, you know, the practical thing is like you play guitar, but you don't have a cellist and you need to record a cello part, which you have in mind for your album. So you could play this and it'll outcome cello. But um, I think the more interesting thing is that it sort of goes more in the way of auto-tune, right? Where auto-tune essentially was trying to solve this problem of people sing out of tune. And so let's fix their intonation. And then it turns out that the, the much more interesting thing that auto-tune does is how when it becomes its own instrument and when you can use it in an entirely new musical way to create entirely new uh, musical sounds. So we're working on now a real-time hardware version of this. That'll be sort of the format of a guitar pedal. Uh, and you can upload different models onto it. Um, the ones that we've got kind of currently running are an 8-bit one guitar, uh, string quartet, um, and the Gregorian chant, which you heard the, um, the uh, ukulele played as a Gregorian chant. So that one is kind of interesting because it was recorded all on vocal music, like uh, church, you know, singing in Latin. Um, and it kind of adds different, uh, like phonemes and vowels to the different input sounds that it doesn't choose randomly. It chooses based on the thing it chooses. It like, you know, is synthesized based on what you give it. Um, and so it's totally, you know, but it, what, what comes out is kind of this like babbling Latinist language, um, which is kind of interesting. I was wondering, Yotam, if uh, anybody here would uh, wanted to like start creating with some of these tools. You showed the the plugins for Ableton Live. Mm -hmm. Do you have other recommendations from like where to start if you want to work more with this? Um. So the, I mean, I think that currently there's not a lot of tools out there for machine learning. I mean, the the Magenta website is probably. Uh, you know, if you Google TensorFlow Magenta, you'll see a lot of tools that they've made. Um, they do require some figuring out, uh, and they're going to require a lot of you to kind of uh, do programming. Not, I mean, like basic programming, but it, you know, it's going to be a, like a bit of a struggle for people who have never worked with the command line. Uh, and then in terms of high-level tools, they again have a few that they've posted on their website um but there's not a lot out there you know i mean eventually this tool that i'm making will be out there and uh i think more and more we're going to start seeing these these tools um but for people who want to hack around there's the magenta studio And the other Magenta tools are probably the highest level at this point in terms of like being able to use them uh, for musicians. I was wondering, you were uh, talking about this uh, Tampa transformation uh, thing here in the end. Um, and you said that the hard part was like doing it real time. And I don't know if you said this, but like how far are you in the process of doing that and making this uh, pedal? Uh, um, We'll have our first uh, like alpha prototypes with the enclosure uh, and everything um, before the end of the year. And then hopefully we'll do maybe a Kickstarter uh, or something um, early or middle of next year is kind of the timeline that we're working on. Uh, yeah, getting it to run fast enough, cheap enough, And high quality enough has all been, you know, one thing that we were trying to solve with hardware is is basically what I was referring to with the previous question, which is the the buy-in to be able to do anything with machine learning or a neural network is extremely high right now. Uh, there's like 
you know, not a lot of kind of end user tools, uh, and especially, you know, not that are totally understandable for uh, musicians wanting to hack around with it. Um, and, you know, they require oftentimes like specialized hardware uh, or a lot, a lot of like playing around with drivers on a really low level, uh, installing a bunch of massive code packages. And it's, it's all stuff that takes a really long time. So we wanted to sell hardware as a way to simplify the process. Uh, this is all ready to go. This is like ready to make music with and you can kind of forget about it. Um, and so there will be definitely a lot of stuff in the years to come, I think, that come out in this vein. Um, but yeah, right now it's, it's uh, kind of cumbersome. If you uh, wanted to uh, train an AI on your voice, would that be Google Magenta, which was, or Magenta Studio uh, uh, for that, or what would you recommend? That is a great question. And that is something that um, uh, currently you could do it with Magenta, um, or there's a, a library called uh, Wave RNN. Um, that would be the way to do it right now if you wanted to. It is something that I'm working on really actively as part of this timbre transfer thing. I think the interesting thing is not the models that I choose and the data sets that I found, but allowing people to create their own. And especially voice being kind of the most interesting, most personal data set that you can generate. Um, so I think that, you know, that's kind of an interesting affordance of machine learning versus uh, just like sample playback, like contact instruments, is that it's not a piano as chosen and sampled by the contact by native instruments. It's not uh, a flute synthesized by whatever the, the plugin maker. It is your flute. It is your mother's piano with the squeaky pedal and the out of tune C note. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, uh, you know, it's training your own model is, uh, again, like a super interesting thing, but at the moment it still requires a lot of like custom and low level stuff. But if you wanted to, and you were really, uh, driven to do that, then I would look at wave RNN is probably the best way to do it at the moment. Okay. Thank you. I was wondering, now you've been speaking a lot about instruments and working with machine learning uh, to yeah, produce sound, but have you worked with it to produce like uh, lyrics? Uh, good question. I have not. Um, there is an album that came out a few years ago that uh, a friend of mine worked on uh, that Sony Machine Learning produced. The song is called Daddy's Car. I don't know if you've, uh, any of you have seen it, but it's got sort of machine learning produced chords, machine learning produced melodies, and machine learning produced lyrics. Um, and it's, uh, it's kind of interesting. I mean, it's like, you know, clearly there's a lot of humans involved. <laughs> uh, like there's human singers and there's human instrumentalists and all these other human aspects. So I think it's kind of like deceiving a little to call it a, like a purely AI pop song, which is what they were going for with the marketing. But um, that's a pretty good example of sort of like the interesting, somewhat nonsense lyrics that uh, the machine learning stuff will produce in terms of text generation. That's a, that's an area which is much easier to kind of get into. Um, if you want to produce your own lyrics with machine learning, uh, the thing to look into would be called, uh, car RNN, C H A R RNN. Uh, and RNN is, it's wave RNN and, and car RNN because RNN is recursive neural network. So something that kind of works in loops. Um, and yeah, and that would be much easier to kind of start generating your own lyrics for nonsense lyrics for songs based on your previous nonsense lyrics for songs. Um, uh, so I've actually got to run, uh, but it was uh, yeah, it was a pleasure uh, presenting to you all, um, and thank you. And uh, yeah, follow up through Twitter or email um, if you have any more questions or if I can be helpful somehow. Thank you so much, Jotem. Really thank nice you so seeing you. Thank you for participating.
Yeah. All right. My pleasure. All right. Take care, everyone.